Okay, thank you. Yeah, very good morning to all. Uh, uh, so, in yesterday, before going to the today's session, so first of all, we'll just review about uh, what is happening, what is happening in the last class. So, in the last class, what you have been seeing is that uh, multi-processor organization may be either independent process organization or it may be a cooperative process organization. A cooperative process is one that can affect or be affected by other processes executing in a system. That implies that both processes are sharing any common resources. That is, both processes are sharing any common resources. It may be a code or it may be a data, whatever it may be. <clears throat> then after that, uh, then we have been seen about a data sharing problem. Whenever a multiple process are running simultaneously, if any data is going to be shared by multiple processes at the same time, if you are not using any proper security mechanism for the data, the data will going to be entered into inconsistent state. In order to overcome the inconsistent state, okay, we have been uh, uses a technique called as uh, process synchronization techniques. Okay, a process synchronization is a set of tools. Uh, Mm. We have set up tools or mechanism to ensure that the data will not enter into inconsistent state. The example what we have been seeing in the last class is a bounded buffer problem where a producer and consumer both are sharing a common variable known as a count variable. This variable is value is initially 5. So after producer producing an item, after the, the count value may be increased and uh, and after consuming the item from the buffer, counter value will be decreased. Both are sharing this. So after producing one item and consuming an item, again the value has to become as 5. But the value is becomes either 4 or 6. This kind of a state is known as inconsistency. In order to overcome this particular inconsistency, okay, so one scientist has been told that a critical section problem. If any algorithm you have been written, that algorithm must satisfy okay, critical section conditions. So what is that particular critical section conditions in the sense? There are three conditions, mutual exclusion, progress requirement, bounded weighting. So mutual exclusion in the sense, um, if any process is executing in its critical section, okay, no other process is allowed to enter into their critical sections. That is, the maximum number of processes that can be allowed to enter into their critical sections is only one process at a time. And after that, um, progress requirement, Okay, whenever a CPU becomes idle, you need to select one job from ready queue and supply the CPU and make the CPU busy at all the times. So, first of all, you need to give a first two priority for the processes. Those who are trying to enter into critical section. Those who are trying to enter into critical section. And number three, uh, bounded weighting. There exists a practical limit on each and every process that can be allowed into the critical section. That's why, again, the process is redefined as... Uh, Okay, like this, a process is simply redefined as it is a continuous collection of uh, critical section followed by remainder section, critical section followed by remainder section. So, in critical section preceded with an entry section and followed by an exit section. So, entry section in the sense uh, simply indicates that whatever the set of resources which is required, okay, uh, whatever the set of resources which is required, that resources is going to be allocated to the particular process, going to be called it as entry section. Once the resources has been successfully okay, allocated, then it is going to be uh, executed in critical section. And after the releasing of resources is in exit section. This is what we have been seeing. And after that, uh, we have been applied this as uh, a written a solution for uh, two processes. So first uh, solution is only satisfies mutual exclusion. Second solution satisfies progress requirement and all the three possibilities are going to be satisfied in the third algorithm. This is what we have been seeing and followed by we have been seeing synchronization hardware. Okay, so the best one, all solutions are synchronized hardware based on locking mechanism. Simply what is this one? Before executing any particular process, first of all, whatever the data items you are going to be required, make a lock on these data items. So then you are allowed to continue your execution. Once your execution is successfully completed, you can release the locks. That's why again the process is redefined as, okay, acquire the locks on the data items, then enter into critical section and release the lock and after that you can enter into remainder section. This is the code what we have been seeing that simply true or false, if in case true, it is already held by someone and if it is false, that particular process is not, and that particular data is not locked by any one of the process. Okay, this is what you have been seeing. 
Now, coming to the today's session is that, okay, synchronization to another very important synchronization tool is that semaphore. So, what is a semaphore? A semaphore, okay, okay, this is a very uh, important and more sophisticated uh, for us, um, synchronized activities. What is a semaphore? A semaphore is a synchronization tool. First of all, a semaphore is a synchronization tool. It is a small variable. You may call it as S. It is a small variable. S yes. <coughs> is an integer variable. Apart from initialization, it is accessed by using only two instructions, weight and signal. Generally, weight is represented with P and signal is represented with V. So, we will see the detailed discussion about what is this weight function and what is this signal function. Before going to this part of one, a very simple logic is that <coughs> this S variable is initialized with 1. This S variable is initialized. Semaphore is a small uh, synchronization variable which is having either 1 or 0. 1 in the sense, okay, that present this particular variable is not locked by any one of the process. And in case if it is equal to 0, if synchronous semaphore variable is going to be 0, it is already locked by someone. It is already locked by in someone. This is a simple logic. A semaphore is a small variable that is attached to each and every common resource which is shared by more than one process at the same time. That variable value is either 1 or 0. If semaphore value is equal to 1, that indicates this particular variable is not uh, accessed by any one of the transactions. This particular variable semaphore value is equal to 1, that indicates this value is not <coughs> locked by any one of the transaction <coughs> in case if it is zero that implies it is already locked by someone that is a very simple thing okay or you can call it as um, if semaphore value is equal to one the maximum number of people that can be allowed is only one person at a time that is in case if the semaphore value is equal to zero that implies it is already locked no one is allowed to access this particular variable now this for apart from initialization, the semaphore value can be accessed or modified by using only two functions, either weight or signal. Okay, either weight or signal. <coughs> so, so let us take an example. Okay, if the semaphore value, suppose x is a variable which is shared by two processes, p1 and p2, and a small semaphore value is attached to that particular x variable. Initially, that x variable is not accessed by anyone. That's why the semaphore variable which is attached to the x is initially 1. Semaphore value is 1. At that implies this particular variable is not accessed by anyone. Suppose if proper the process P1 make a requisition to the operating system, I want x. Then immediately operation system checks that what is the value of semaphore of x. The semaphore x value is now 1. That implies at present it is not accessed by anyone. And then immediately it allocates the x variable to process P1. And after immediately allocating, the semaphore value becomes 0. And after the process, we to make a requisition. I want to access the semaphore variable. Okay, I want to access x. Then immediately, operating system checks that what is the semaphore value of x. Then immediately, it finds that the semaphore value is now 0. That implies it is already locked by process p1. Now, we are not allowed to continue the execution. Then operating system simply put the process p2 in waiting state. The operating system will simply put the process in <coughs> waiting state. Okay, <coughs> now so once a process, <coughs> once process P1 has been completed task, then it would immediately okay so, so tell you that it would immediately tell you that my task is done. Okay, <coughs> my task is done. Immediately operating system will change the semaphore value from again zero to one and gives. Uh, a signal to process P to come. You can use this particular variable now. That's enough. This is okay. How it is going to be happen? That implies this particular X variable is now accessed by only one process at a time. It is hundred percent guarantees that the data is does not enter into any inconsistent state. That's enough. So now, sir, how can I access this particular semaphore variable? In case of any process required any particular common resource, it first of all issues a weight function, the weight system called to operating system. So I am waiting for this semaphore variable. So then immediately the operating system checks that what is the semaphore value. In case if it is equal to 1, immediately sanction that particular resource. If it is not equal to 1, you have to wait until the value becomes 1. That's it. Once your cross-execution has been completed, again, 
the um, process will going to be return the butter semaphore value by using a um, function called a system call function signal. Now, how this particular weight function call has been? This is a small piece of code. Anyone can write this particular one. Weight is a function which takes um, one semaphore value as an input. Suppose if process P1 is requesting for any particular uh, variable x, then immediately it checks that. Immediately it checks that what is the semaphore value. If s value is initially not a, if it is less than or equal to zero, that implies s value is less than or equal to zero. That implies now it is already locked by someone. You are not allowed to enter into the critical section. That result is not sanctioned to you. You have to wait until this particular semaphore value becomes okay one. Okay, so in case if it is already locked, what is the semaphore value? It is zero. Zero less than or equal to zero. That implies you are not allowed to go on operation. Why? Because it is already used by someone. Suppose if it is equal to one. Okay, it is not locked by anyone. That is, one is less than or equal to zero. No, the condition is failed. Immediately you are entered into critical section by making s is equal to s minus one. Now one minus one semaphore value becomes zero. If any person is trying to again enter it, then the semaphore value is zero. So that that particular guy is going to be simply structured in this value. So the simple logic is that s is equal to s minus one. Suppose if the process has been successfully completed, it I go it uh, operation. If the process is successfully completed, it's operation. Then uh, then it issues a um, system call for a signal. So what is that signal? So then now the semaphore value is zero. Zero plus one. One. One indicates that now the resource is idle. Now anyone can use this one. This is a simple logic how they have been implemented. The okay. case. So, what is a semaphore? A semaphore is a synchronization tool. It is a small integer variable. Okay, apart from initialization, this particular variable is accessed by, okay, accessed by using only weight and signal. So, before executing any particular process, whatever the common variables you require, you have to make a requisition for semaphore variable of that particular common resource using a weight system call. Once your execution has been successfully completed, you have to return back the semaphore variable of the common resource or a data using a system call for it as signal. It's called it as signal. That's it. Now, this kind of semaphore is also going to be called it as, um, we are also having, this particular semaphore is going to be having only two values, one or zero. That is, uh, one in the sense, uh, it is uh, free and zero in the sense it is already locked. This kind of a semaphore, under where the semaphore value is going to be lies between zero and one, where the last semaphore value is uh, lies between zero and one. Such kind of a semaphore are going to be called it as binary semaphore. Such kind of a semaphore is going to be called it as binary semaphores. Okay, now in case if the semaphore value is um, not restricted. It can be any value than such kind of a semaphore is going to be called it as counting semaphore, where the integer value of a semaphore can range over unrestricted domain. Then it is going to be the range over unrestricted domain that is going to be called it as counting semaphore. So actually, so far what the solution we have been seeing, it is only binary semaphore. Now we are going to see how to solve synchronization problem. Okay. Uh, can solve various uh, the semaphores can solve various synchronization problems, but it is also having a small problems. Let us take a small example. Mm -hmm. Okay, in order to under better understanding of this one, let us take P1 and P2 that requires um, S1 happen to be before S2. Okay, both are sharing a common resource. Both are process P1, process P2, both are going to be sharing a common resource. Okay, now already we have been designed a program in such a way that the statement 1 is executed before the statement 2. So both our statement 1 and statement 2 are sharing a common resource. So create a semaphore is initialized with um, something uh, 0, whatever it may be. Okay. Uh, now semaphore statement 1 is executed. So after that immediately it is releasing the semaphore value. And meanwhile the process P2 is first of all initially waiting for synchronization variable. Once it is obtained, then it is allowed to continue. This is the piece of code. How do you write this one? That's why, again, the process is going to be redefined as like this. Okay. Now, repeat until false. Now, so this particular semaphore variable, sync, a synchronization variable, 
it is a mutually exclusive variable this variable is accessible by only one person at a time okay this variable is accessible by only one process at a time this variable is accessible by only one process at a time that's why i can call this one as a mutually exclusive variable that's why now the process is written as now i am waiting for the mutually exclusive variable which is uh, once this particular semaphore has been successfully allocated for me then i am going to enter into the critical section once immediately after my uh, critical section again i need to release this particular semaphore variable this is called as uh, the release is going to be done by using signal that is that is done by using the signal the entry section okay waiting for mutex variable is going to be called as an entry section and releasing the particular mutex variable is going to be called as exit section is going to be called as exit section and remainder section can be executed any time there is no problem why because uh, while executing this kind of an instruction the cpu can okay, remaining no other process is going to be suffered at all okay so all you may this is waiting for a mutex enter into the critical section and after that signal the mutex followed by remainder section this is what is a process is ready definition now we are going to be uh, semaphore practical implementation in case if any data is going to be shared by more than uh, two processes at the same time how can you protect it okay so you must guarantee that no two processes can execute wait and signal on the same semaphore at the same time okay now in this particular semaphore implementation what we going to see is that okay whenever a data item is going to be accessed by multiple processes at the same time how can you in this one okay how can you protect that particular variable this can be done by using counting semaphore you know what is counting semaphore where uh, the semaphore value is is an unrestricted unrestricted domain semaphore value is unrestricted whereas in the case of binary semaphore the semaphore value is always lies between 0 and 1 the semaphore value is always lies between 0 and 1 the main disadvantage of the above solution what we have been seen is that they are going to be suffer with busy waiting while a process in its critical section other process that tries to enter into the critical section must loop continuously in the entry code itself in the entry code itself the continued loop is clearly a problem in the real uh, in the real time multi programming system okay this kind of a thing is also going to be call it as spin lock okay why because uh, the process spins while you know, the process spins in while loop waiting for the lock the advantage of spin lock is that no context switch is required when a process must wait on a lock that is a very very important beautiful point is that so while you are waiting there is no context switch you are simply stuck in while loop you are simply stuck in while loop there is no context switch why because um, okay <clears throat> so there is no context switch is going to be required so you know what is context switch saving and restoring there is no saving and restoring is going to be done the cp cycles is simply unnecessarily wasting the cp cycles are unnecessarily okay you are wasting for this particular cycles now to in order to overcome this particular problem busy waiting we can modify the definition of a wait signal of semaphore okay when a process executes a wait operation um, and finds that semaphore value okay depending on uh, priority must wait <clears throat> now we'll see how do you define it uh, before going to the detailed discussion of multiple process solution that is counting semaphore first of all you must guarantee that no two processes these are the precautions you need to be take before trying to implement a solution for a counting semaphore so you must guarantee that no two processes can execute wait and signals on the same semaphore at the same time that is the first very important one next <clears throat> mm. and can, coming to the next very important one is that the implementation becomes a critical section problem where wait and signal code are placed in critical section so you are telling that wait and signal cannot be done in simultaneous manner that implies this wait and signal must be executed in a critical section you know what is critical section in case if any process is executing in its critical section then no other process is allowed to execute in their critical section that implies the maximum number of processes that can be allowed to enter into the critical section is only one so what i say is that wait and signal signal functions cannot be executed at the same time that implies wait and signals 
functions must be kept it on critical section that implies while executing wait function no one is allowed to use signal and while executing signal function no one is allowed to issue wait function that is so this is a very one so what is okay the implementation becomes the critical section problem where wait and signal code must be placed in critical section that implies so okay the, while executing wait no one is allowed to execute signal while executing signal no one is allowed to wait with each semaphore um, okay uh, and the third very important point is that okay with each semaphore there is an associated waiting queue what is this waiting queue the list of processes waiting for this particular semaphore value okay earlier we have been seen a binary semaphore okay binary in the sense only two processes we have been seen yes or no now the list of process who are waiting for this particular semaphore value has to be kept in a queue and once the resource is becomes free we need to allocate this particular semaphore variable to any one of the waiting process any one of the waiting process that may be done depending on priority order it may be that is so you need to maintain another thing is called it as waiting queue what is this waiting queue the list of processes which are waiting for this particular has two data items each entry in a queue has uh, two data items what is the value what is the pointer to the next record in the list and okay, what after executing this particular process okay so what is the next process going to be executed okay what is the next process is going to be executed what is the next process is going to be executed now let us take now coming to the next one uh, two operations so we are also having another two operation we have been already seen two system calls that is one is wait and second one is signal and we are also going to be see another two system calls going to be called as block and wake up so what is this particular block and wake up signals okay block is a system call place the process invoking the operation on the appropriate waiting queue okay and wake up remove one process in the waiting queue and place in in ready queue Mm -hmm. in the ready queue now what is this suppose if a process is requesting for a, a resource if a process is requesting for a, a resource if a process is at the time the process is going to be already mm, the resource is already allocated to some another process the resource is already allocated to some other process okay then uh, the operating system will simply ask you to wait but after some moment of time again this process make a requisition to the operating system i am require this resource again operating system will going to be simply checks that and we ask him to wait but cpu cycles is unnecessarily wasting for okay checking the semaphore value that's why what the operating system will going to be do is that simply issue is a block system call and this process requisition is blocked until that semaphore value becomes free you are not continuously allowed to give an interrupt to the or give a system call to the operating system for um, the semaphore variable once the resource is becomes free the operating itself will give you a system call call it as a wake up operating system will going to be simply gives you a wake up system call then then uh, immediately you are going to be removing one process from the ready from the queue the waiting queue and uh, put the job in ready queue for execution this is what is happening so totally we are using four system calls this is wait and this is signal okay this is signal and another one is block and another one is wake up now we are going to be see how to implement the piece of code now i have been simply i am defining a structure okay a value and the list of processes this is waiting for this particular semaphore variable i have been defined as a semaphore now the wait is implemented like this simple okay initially semaphore value is going to be initially one that implies at the time the semaphore value is not locked by any one of the process so in case uh, there are n processes are running p1 p2 so on up to pn if first of all p1 make a requisition for semaphore variable at the time the semaphore value is one so immediately the semaphore value is sanctioned to the immediately semaphore value is sanctioned to p1 that semaphore value simply becomes as zero okay now p1 is allowed to continue the execution now the semaphore value is becomes zero now okay p1 is executing in its critical section now process p2 makes a requisition to 
the semaphore variable. Now at the time the semaphore value is equal to zero, zero minus one, that is equal to minus one. So now minus one in the sense there is one person is waiting for the semaphore variable. Another person is making a requisition for this particular semaphore variable. Then immediately minus one minus one that becomes minus two. That implies minus two indicates okay there are two persons are waiting in the semaphore. Okay, so on up to like this. Okay, this is uh, whenever a process requesting for a wait system call, the semaphore value is decremented. In case um, if it is not equal to zero, then in wait is that the process is simply put in in a queue and ask him to wait. In case if any process has been successfully completed, then it releases the resource. Then semaphore value is automatically incremented by one. So semaphore value is automatically incremented by one, and any one of the process is removed from the queue and they again supply the CPU. Now we'll see how the semaphore code is. Suppose initially semaphore value is equal to one, so no one is uh, using this particular semaphore variable. First to process P1. First process P1 make a requisition for the semaphore variable S. Immediately S value is equal to minus minus. That implies one minus minus it becomes zero. Zero less than zero? No. <clears throat> zero less than zero? No. No. That process is going to be entered into the critical section. Suppose at the end, after entering into the critical session, process P2 make a requisition for semaphore variable S by using a system called wait S. Now, so now the semaphore value is zero. Zero minus minus. Now it becomes minus one. Minus one is less than zero. Then add this process in your linked list and ask him to queue waiting state and block by itself. Block in the cells. Please don't try to continuously make uh, a requisition to the operating system. Once the resources becomes free, once the semaphore value becomes free, then the operating system itself it will going to be wake up you. Don't uh, continuously okay knock the CPU for this particular semaphore variable. Suppose another process is comes and uh, ask for the semaphore variable s. Now the semaphore variable is minus one, minus one, minus minus. That is equal to minus two. Minus two is less than zero. Again, this process is for. This condition is satisfied. Again, this particular process is put in under Q. This process is put in under Q and block the interrupt. Suppose in case if the first process has been completed, immediately it issues a signal called a signal. Then one signal. Now the semaphore value is minus two. So minus two plus plus. Then minus one. Minus one is less than or equal to zero. That implies some people are waiting in the queue. Remove any one of the process from the serial list and give a wake up signal to continue the execution in critical section. That's this. This is how it is going to be implemented. Now, this particular semaphore uh, uh, technique is very simple, but it is also facing with a small problem called it as deadlock. Okay, you know what is a deadlock? A deadlock is simply defined as a continuous waiting state of a particular process is known as deadlock. A continuous waiting state of a particular process, okay, <clears throat> known as um, process, or you can define it as Okay, you already know that. What is a process? A process can be thought of as it is a program in execution. In order to execute such kind of a process, it required resources like CPU cycles, memory cycles, and I/O devices, etc. So, whatever the set of resources you are going to require, first of all, you have to make a request to the operating system. I want these resources. At the time, the resources are available. There is no problem. If in case resources are not available, then operating system will going to be put your process in wait state. There may be a chance that this wait state is not going to be changed forever, hence it is going to be called as deadlock. Okay, deadlock can also be defined in a different way in a multi-programming environment. Two or more processes are concurrently running. In case if any process is holding some resource and waiting for the resource handed by another process, similarly that process is also holding some resources and waiting for the resources handed by this process. Then both processes are not allowed to continue the execution. Hence. This is indefinite blocking. It is going to be called it as a dead lock. That is, a two or more processes are waiting indefinitely for an event that can be caused by only one of the waiting processes. It is going to be called it as dead lock. Let us take an example. There are two variables are there S and Q, two semaphore variables initialized with one, two semaphore variables, and there are two processes are running P not and P one. There are two processes are running in my computer system. That is, one is P not and second one is P one. Both P not and P one requires S and Q semaphore variables. Okay, both P not and P one requires okay S and Q variables. Both P not and P one S and what happens is that suppose if P not is hold a lock on S and waiting for Q 
and similarly process p1 is holding a lock on q and waiting for s and p0 is waiting for signal q and p1 is waiting for signal s then both processes are not allowed to continue their execution and this particular situation is going to be call it as deadlock or may call it as deadlock okay deadlock starvation also okay what is this p0 is holding s and waiting for q and that implies p0 is waiting for signal s similarly process p1 holding q and waiting for the semaphore variable s that implies p1 is waiting for the signal yes so this one is this guy is waiting for signal s this guy is waiting for signal q this guy is not releases here okay yes and this guy does not releases to until their execution is complete and this two process enters into a deadlock situation this is called it as indefinite blocking a process may never be removed from a semaphore queue in which it is suspended such kind of a situation is going to be called it as starvation now how can you work on this button <clears throat> now we all <clears throat> that implies uh, the locks are always going to be obtained by high priority processes the locks are going to be semaphore variables is always locked by high priority then what happens about low priority processes low priority process are always waiting for high priority has to be completed that but never this in case if the low priority process never gains a control then what happens then we'll go up for aging concept to improve the priority that's it now what happens let us take an example in this while executing a low priority process a high priority interrupt has been encountered what you need to do immediately the low priority process is preempted and the response is given to high priority process but in this situation what happens is that if a low priority process is holding a lock on some common data if you are forcibly stopping the execution of this low priority and giving the control of the cpu to some another one then what happens is that the data is again in inconsistent state in this situation the high priority process must be wait until the low priority process has been completes its critical section in case if you take a forcibly what happens is the data is inconsistent state. that is the reason now in this situation high priority process must be wait until the low priority one has to be completed high priority process must be wait until the low priority one has to be completed this kind of a technique is going to be called as priority inversion this concept is going to be called as priority inversion this kind of a concept is going to be called priority and normally the low priority process has to be wait until high priority one has to be completed but whereas in the case of a semaphore uh, variable in case of semaphore variable is locked by semaphore variable is already accessed by a low priority process in this situation a high priority process must be wait until the low priority one has to be complete so this is also known as uh, this kind of a solution is implemented in okay uh, priority inheritance protocol this kind of a thing is going to be implemented in priority inheritance protocol okay that is a separate discussion it is not required here now we'll move on to how this particular semaphore solutions can be used to solve classical problems of synchronization now i get uh, this um, semaphore variables this semaphore solution how it can be used to solve classical synchronization problems what is uh, what are the various uh, problems we are going to be see in classical synchronization problems now we are going to be it is a large class of concurrency control problems it is a large class of concurrency control problems among that we deal only three problems generally an operating system must uh, implement all this number one bounded buffer problem already we have been discussed in the earlier okay in bounded buffer problem the buffer is going to be shared by producer and consumer so producer and consumer buffer going to be shared by using a common variable count so producer is always incrementing count and consumer is decrementing count if you are not using any proper security mechanism for the count variable which can be used to tell that when the buffer is full and when the buffer is empty okay so in case we are not using any proper security mechanism for the count uh, the data will going to be enters into inconsistent and how can you overcome that problem by using semaphore we'll see now similarly read and write problem a variable can be read it by any number of people at the same time there is no problem at all concurrent readers are allowable 
but concurrent operators are not allowable. Suppose let us take an example. Whenever a data item is shared by multiple process at the same time, if multiple readers can be allowed to access the data variable at the same time. So if one reader is already reading, any number of readers is eligible. There is no problem. But no writer is accepted at the moment. That is first one. And case number two, if one writer is performing a write operation on the data, a common data item, then no reader or writer is allowed to make an operation on the time. That implies read read is no problem. Read write, write read, write write. Any one of the operation is right, the data is in inconsistent. So see, concurrent items are allowed, concurrent operators are not allowed. Okay. If one reader is reading, for a data item, any number of readers is allowed to read the data item, but no writer is allowed. If one writer is writing, no reader or writer is allowed to make a operation on the data item. That's enough. In case, if you are not following this particular rule, the data is in inconsistent state. How can you protect this? We'll see now using semaphores. Now, dining philosophers, it is another classical synchronization problem. Okay. Uh, we'll see with an example of dining philosophers. Okay. Now, coming to the next one. A bounded buffer problem. There is n buffers, each each can having a capability of holding one data item, which is to be uh, take a printout. Now I have used uh, okay new one mutex variable initialized as one semaphore variable initialized to value one. This variable is accessible only one person at a time. Okay, and I am using another semaphore variable. Okay, full initialize the value to zero. Initialize the value to zero. That indicates that the same. Okay, <laughs> initialize the value. It is indicates that whether the buffer is uh, empty or not. Okay, whether the producer is allowed to place any item on the buffer or not. Okay, that is another one. A semaphore empty is initialized, initialize it to the value of n. That implies uh, your buffer is having a capability of holding n items. If the buffer is equal to n, consumer is allowed to retrieve any particular item from it. Now. <clears throat> we'll see how to implement this particular one. I have been totally taken three semaphore variable mutex, full and empty. Mutex is used to protect the count variable. We are producer is making count is equal to count plus one. Consumer is making count is equal to count minus one. To protect that, we use mutex variable. Full is variable. Full in the sense it is not indicating that the buffer is full. Okay, producer is in case. Uh, Producer is allowed to place one item on the buffer. There is a space for placing an item into the buffer. That indicates. If empty, in the sense, it is not empty. Okay, now consumer is allowed to retrieve an item from the buffer. That's it. Now we'll see with an example. Now, <clears throat> suppose if producer want to produce an item into the buffer. So first of all, you need to check that whether buffer is having an space for placing an item onto the buffer. Buffer is having a place. Uh, Space for placing an item. Producer produce an item. And first of all, I am checking that weight empty. First of all, okay, weight empty in the sense I am not indicating that for placing an item into the buffer. Okay, understood everyone? Weight empty in the sense, empty in the sense, I am not saying that buffer is empty. At least there is one, um, one place is there for placing an item. That is, once. In case if buffer is having a sufficient place for placing an item, immediately you are not allowed to enter into critical section. Then you need to change the variable of count. So if you want to change the variable of count, then at the same time if the consumer is want to change the item value, then what happens? That um, count value, that is inconsistent. That's why I am waiting for mutex variable. Once the count mutex variable is obtained to you, then you are allowed to continue the execution. Once our execution is successfully completed, you need to release the semaphore variable of count, that is mutex. Realize. And after that, you indicate signal full. Full in the sense buffer is not full. Yes, there is one item for consumer retrieve from the buffer. Okay, and take a print. That is full indicates that. Yes, now consumer is allowed to take an item from the buffer. This process is repeated until it becomes true. Total values are complete. So consumer is waiting for this full. Now see, <coughs> producer is issuing a signal full. That is, consumer is waiting for that. Yes, wait full. So once you have been wait full, that implies waiting for full in the sense, yes, at least one item is there for consuming from the buffer. Wait full indicates that at least one item is there for consuming from the 
ma'am. And immediately once item is there in the buffer, you are not allowed to enter it to the critical section. You will need to get the semaphore value of count to decrement the value of the count. So now we are uh, issuing a command call it as wait mutex. That is, we are getting the semaphore value. Now count uh, after uh, placing the, uh, remove the item from the buffer, count is becomes count minus one. Then you need to release that particular count semaphore variable. And after that again, empty, signal empty. What is signal empty? There is a space for placing an item into the buffer. Now for this system call, he is waiting. Now you see, he is given signal empty. He is waiting for empty. He is given signal full. He is waiting for full. full. That's it. Like this. Both are going to be communicate with each and every other. Okay. This is going to be called it as uh, process communication. You can call it as. Now there is no process of inconsistency. I can solve this bounded buffer problem simply by using three semaphore variables. Number one is uh, mutex for uh, count. And number in order to place an item, I use a full variable. In order to retrieve an item, I use an empty variable. These are the three semaphores which can be used for protecting. Okay, you are solving bounded buffer problem. Next, the second uh, very important classical synchronization problem is that a reader writer's problem. So, what is reader writer's problem? So, before going to the reader writer's problem, so first of all, you must know that okay, whenever two operations are said to be inconsistent, any one of the operation is right. Any one of the operation is right. That is the first very important thing you must know that a read read is no problem. Read write, write read, write write. In these three situations, the data is in inconsistent state. We also deal this particular problem in DBMS by using locking techniques. We will see that topic in your DBMS. Now, how can you explain this particular reader response? Now. A data set is shared among a number of concurrent processes. I am assuming that a one data set has been shared by a number of uh, processes at the same time. Concurrent in the sense all processes are allowed at the same time for execution. All the processes are allowed for um, simultaneous execution. Okay, now readers only read the data set. Reader in the sense he can eligible for making only read operation. He do not perform any update operations at all. He, this guy is a reader. In case if any process is said to be a reader, that implies that process is only eligible for reading the contents, is not allowed to update anyone. Writer in the sense, in case if any process is said to be writer, <coughs> he can eligible for both read and as well as and write. Okay. Now the problem is allow multiple readers to read the at the same time. But only single writer can access the standard data at the same time. If a person, okay, the data item is uh, read by any number of people at the same time. That is uh, why, because no one is making an updation on the data item. That's why the data is always in consistent state. There is no problem at all. If any single person is making a write at the same time, if no other person is eligible for making a read or write, in case we do like that, the data is going to be in inconsistent state. The data is in inconsistent state. So now, in order to overcome this particular problem, in order to overcome this data sharing problem, we have, now, we'll take one semaphore, read write mutex is initialized with one, okay, read write mutex, that is mutually exclusive variable, semaphore mutex is initialized by one, we'll take, and uh, we'll take another uh, integer variable read count, initialize it to zero. <coughs> we'll see one, one, one. <coughs> now, <coughs> what is this read count? Initially, read count is equal to zero. If one person making a read, then initially next immediately read count becomes one. If another person is making a want to read, then immediately the read permission is sanctioned. Now read count becomes two. If another person want to read it, again okay, again the read permission is sanctioned. Now count value becomes zero. Sorry, count value becomes three. So the number of readers now is three. Suppose if any person want to make a write, sorry, no one is allowed. If count value, read count value is equal to zero, there is no reader is reading. If now the read count is three, that implies there are three readers are reading. At that moment, no writer is allowed, no writer is permitted to access this one. The writer is put in wait state. That's it. If one uh, reader is completed its read operation, now the count value becomes three minus one, two. Another reader is completed, again, two minus one, 
one. Another reader is completed. One minus one. Now the read read count value becomes zero. Once the read count is becomes zero, then if anyone is making a requisition for write, then immediately a write lock is obtained on that. Then write operation is allowed to continue. Now while writing, while performing a write operation, while performing a write operation, if any person making a read or write, <coughs> CP does not allow you to continue your operation. <coughs> okay, that's enough. This is now you see that every reader before reading is implementing count is equal to count plus one, read count is equal to read count plus one. After performing a read operation, he issues a command read count is equal to read count minus one. Now all readers are sharing a common variable read count. So before reading, they are incrementing the count value. After performing reading, they are decrementing the count value. Agreed, everyone. Now, so if you are not using any proper security mechanism for this read count, the data is in inconsistent state. Same problem in bounded buffer. Okay, already read count is five. Suppose another person is read it. Now count value becomes six. One save. One another one is completed a read operation. Again, it has to come back to five. If you are not using any proper security mechanism for this read count, the value is either four or six. You know that that earlier example. Same manner. In order to protect this particular variable, again we are using another semaphore that is mutex, mutually exclusive variable. We are using mutually exclusive variable. This is for read-write mutex. Once a person is uh, making a write, no one is allowed to read or write at the same time. Is it clear? This mutex is for protecting count, and this mutex is for uh, protecting read-write operations are not simultaneously allowed. Okay. Now, before going to the solution of uh, this particular reader-writer's problem. <laughs> In order to, uh, okay, for, before going to the detailed discussion about uh, this solution, so first of all, <clears throat> okay, you need to keep uh, this particular two points in your mind. The first variation, no reader kept writing unless the writer has permission to use a shared object. Okay, any number of readers is allowed at the same time. The second version, once a writer is ready for making write, as soon as it has to be completed, it's write operation. Why? Because all readers and writers are blocked for your writing process. This is a very important two points you need to be kept on your mind before going to the solutions of this particular reader writer problem. Is it clear? No reader kept writing unless writer has a permission to use the shared object. Okay, so <clears throat> any number of readers is eligible if no one is obtained a permission on write. Okay. And the second variation is that once a writer is ready, it performs a writer as soon as possible. Now we'll see the solution. The writer process is very simple. Waiting for read-write mutex. That implies at that time, no reader or writer is performing an operation on the data item. <clears throat> is it clear, everyone? I am taking a semaphore variable read-write mutex. That implies at the time no reader or writing making any operation on the data. In case no reader or writer is there, then you are allowed to okay, continue on the critical section. Once your critical section is completed, now you need to release your semaphore variable read write meetings. Is it clear? So writer process is very simple. Now coming to the read write uh, reader process. If any process want to enter into if any process want to enter into critical section, first of all, he has to wait for the mutex variable of read count. You have to get the semaphore variable of read count. The semaphore variable of read count, we name it as mutex. The semaphore variable of read count variable is mutex. Once this mutex is obtained, then read count is equal to read count plus plus. If read count is equal to one, that implies you are the only one person now presently reading, no one is there, that implies, then you can eligible for promoting write. Why? Because there is no other readers are there, no writers are there. Then you can make a requisition. I am waiting for read-write mutex. At the time it is available, it sanction you, otherwise it is not allowed you. Now, so once this read count is incremented, then you need to release this particular read count variable. I have been released it. After that, I am eligible for performing read operation. So after performing read operation, again, I need to decrement the value of count. So before decrementing the particular value 
first of all i need to obtain the semaphore variable of count the semaphore variable of count is mutex the semaphore variable of mutex is semaphore variable of mutex is count count now read count so you need to get that the semaphore variable and after that the count value is decremented count value is decremented if read count is equal to 0 read count is equal to 0 then you can issue no reader is reading now if anyone is waiting for write you can give for uh, read write mutex this is this this guy is waiting for this one and this is happening now and after once the read count is decremented you need to give signal mutex you need to give signal mutex that's it. this is what is the code is so now while reading one data one person reading in any number of readers is allowed while one person no one is eligible for writing one person is making a write no one is allowed for reading and as well as writing this is how do you, how we have been solved reader write is problem now we move on to the last problem and this is a dining philosopher's problem what is this particular dining philosopher's problem there are five scientists are there this particular people are having only two tasks in their real time thinking whenever they feel hungry they are eating the philosophers spend their lives for alternating thinking and eating thinking and eating there is they are completely sacrificing their lives for the people that is um, they are completely thinking and eating thinking and eating they are always trying to invent something new don't interact with their neighbors occasionally okay this particular people are don't try to interact with the people occasionally and try to pick up two chopsticks one at a time okay to eat uh, from a bowl suppose let us take each and everyone has been uh, having some rice on their uh, plates and each uh, uh, one chopstick has been placed in between this particular blades in order to eat uh, in order to eat this particular thing everyone needs a uh, two chopsticks for eating but only there are five chopsticks are there if everyone is holding one chopstick and what happens is that every philosopher is holding one chopstick and waiting for the chopsticks hold by some other one then no one is allowed to eat then all processes are going to enter into deadlock now there is a shared data that is um, a bowl of rice that is a bowl of rice so in case they want to pick up the rice and put it on the bowl so what needed to do that they need a two chopsticks they need a two chopsticks so if everyone is holding one chopstick and waiting for another chopstick the data is going to be in deadlock state so a bowl of rice is a data set so in case you want to put the rice and their plates what they need to do <coughs> Okay, <clears> there <throat> has to pick up two chopsticks. So now I have been defined a semaphore variable. Chopstick five is initialized as one. That is all uh, five semaphore variables has been declared. Now how have been implemented? If process pi want to enter into the critical section, that implies they want to eat, and this thinking is going to be called as a remainder section. There is no problem if one person is thinking, and similarly at the same time, remaining persons also can think it. There is no problem. This is let us take an example. If a process PI want to enter into the critical section, he wants chopstick I, and he wants to immediately write the chopstick. <clears throat> you want immediately write chopstick. That implies process P not is holding chopstick zero and waiting for suppose. And in case process P not want to eat, it require chopstick zero and one. If process P one want to eat, uh, one and two is required. So on up to like this. Okay, if process P four want to eat, it requires four and as well as zero. That's why if the process P I want to enter into the critical section, first of all he has to hold a lock on. Okay, first of all he has to waiting for chopstick I and next to chopstick I plus one mod five. It is in circular manner. That's why we use modular five. If both chopsticks are sanctioned from the operating system, then you are allowed to eat. Once your eating is complete, that is your critical section is completed. Once your critical section is completed, again you need to release the two chopsticks. You need to release the two chopsticks, and after that you can enter into remainder section. That's enough. This is simple solution. Of course, okay, it may causes uh, deadlock, and starvation is also 
possible at worst, it may cause starvation is also <coughs> that's it. This is uh, completes our discussion about uh, process synchronization. This is completes our discussion about process synchronization. Now we move on to the next topic of discussion is that <coughs> deadlocks. Next we'll move on to the next topic of discussion is deadlocks. Okay, so in this session, uh, what we have been seen is the process synchronization. So, for example, a hardware tool we have been choose <coughs> that is test and set lock, and we have been seen semaphore tool. And by using semaphores, we have been solved <coughs> three problems. <coughs> number one is uh, bounded buffer problem. Number two, read and write problem. Number three. <coughs> Planning philosopher's problem. <laughs> that is complete our discussion. Now coming to the last topic of discussion and process management is deadlocks. So now we move on to the last topic of discussion and process management uh, is the deadlocks. We have been completed process. Process scheduling, process synchronization. Now the last topic is deadlocks. Now before going to the detailed discussion about <coughs> deadlock uh, things, now we'll define the various standard definitions for deadlock. So coming to the first very important definition of a deadlock <coughs> is a continuous waiting state of a particular process is known as deadlock. This is the first definition of a deadlock. And this is a first definition of a deadlock. A continuous waiting state of a particular process is known as deadlock. What is the meaning of this? Already we have been known that. What is a process? A process can be thought of as it is a program under execution. <coughs> In order to execute such kind of a process, it requires resources like CPU cycles, memory cycles, IO devices, etc. But all these particular resources are under the control of operating system. So before executing any particular process, first of all, you have to make a requisition to the operating system. I want these particular resources. <coughs> so you have to make a requisition to the operating system. I want these resources. Once the resource is granted, then you are allowed to continue the execution. So once your execution is complete, again you need to return back all these particular resources to <coughs> operating system. <coughs> okay, now, so whatever the resources we are requested, at the time the resource is not available from the operating system, then what operating system will do? Then operating system will going to be put your process in wait state. Then operating system will going to be put your process in Wait state. There may be a chance that this wait state is not going to be changed forever. Hence, it is going to be called it as deadlock. Hence, there may be a chance that this wait state is not going to be changed forever. Hence, it is going to be called it as deadlock. This is one uh, standard definition for deadlock. So, we'll see some of the other definitions <coughs> in a little while. Now, we'll see. Uh, let us assume that the system is consisting of uh, some set of resources. The resources are uh, named as R1, R2, so on up to Rm. In order to execute, the resources may be either it's CPU cycles or it may be memory cycles or it may be IO devices, on up to CPU registers, etc. Already that's why I have been told that process definition is clearly a process can be thought of as it is a program in execution. In order to execute such kind of a process, it required a resources like CPU cycles, memory cycles, IO devices, CPU registers, etc. That is what is the resources. The resources means in order to execute your process, you require CPU time, you require CPU registers, you require memory space, you require IO devices. This all comes under the category of resources of a particular process. 
So the resources are not only one in uh, only one or two or any. It have WIF instances. You may have <coughs> uh, ten registers. Okay, there are ten in uh, in registers are there. You have two printers are connected uh, to your network. Then you, there are two instances of printers are there. There are two tape drives are there. There are three tape uh, tape drives are there. You can have any number of instances of resources. Now, so how the system model has been implemented? Now, the system has been implemented. The system model has been implemented by using three system calls. The system model has been implemented <coughs> by using three system calls: request, use, and release. So now I have been told that before executing any particular process, whatever the set of resources you are required, you have to make a requisition to the operating system. I want these resources by using request system call. By using <coughs> by using request system call once the resource is sanctioned then using use system call you are allowed to continue your operation once your execution is complete you need to release your resources by to the operating system by using a system call known as release by using a system call known as release okay so these are the three system calls which is required to implement any kind of a system Okay, that's enough. Request, use, and release. So before executing a process, whatever the set of resources you are required to uh, continue your execution, that can be done by using request system calls. Once the resources are obtained, you are allowed to continue your execution by using use system call. Once your execution is complete, you need to release the resources by using release system call. That's it. this is how the system model is implemented. Now we see some another definitions. A uh, deadlock definitions is that a deadlock with the same resource type, a deadlock with a different resource type may be happen. Now we'll see. In a multi-programming environment, more than one process is competing for the resource. If in case, if any process is holding some resources and waiting for the resources held by some another process, similarly that process is also holding some set of resources and waiting for the resource held by this process. Then both processes are not allowed to continue the execution. And this particular situation is going to be called as deadlock. Hence, this particular situation is going to be called as deadlock. Now we'll see with an example. Okay, <laughs> deadlock with same resource type. Deadlock with same resource type. Deadlock with <laughs> same resource type. Suppose uh, my computer is having <laughs> two tape drives. My computer is having two tape drives. My computer is having how many tape drives? Um, my computer is having two tape drives. So, in order to execute process, there are two processes running. There are two processes running in my computer system. In order to execute these particular two processes, uh, you know, um, uh, they require tape drives. Process P1 two tape drives, and process P2 also require two tape drives. Suppose what happens is that time T not proper spare time process P1 has been taken one, one tape right in time T not time P1 process P1 has been uh, obtained another tape right so that implies process P0 is holding one tape right and waiting for the tape drive held by P1 similarly process P1 is holding one tape right and waiting for the tape drive held by process P0 then these two processes are not allowed to continue the execution hence this particular situation is going to be called as Deadlock. Hence, this particular situation is going to be called as a deadlock with the same resource type. Let us take another example. Deadlock with some different resource type. My computer is equipped with uh, two resources. One is tape drive, one is printer. There are two processes running, P1 and P2. In order to execute process P1, it requires tape drive and printer. Process P2 is also required tape drive and printer. In time T0, process P1 is make a lock on tape drive. And time T0 or T1, okay. Process P2 make a lock on printer. Now, process P1 hold a lock on tape drive and waiting for the printer that is already held by P2. Similarly, P2 is also holding printer and waiting for the lock uh, held by P1 of tape drive. Then both processes are not allowed to continue the execution. Hence, this particular situation is called as a deadlock. And this particular situation is going to be called as deadlock. This kind of a deadlock is going to be called as 
in the deadlock with different resource type. Simply a uh, one line answer for a deadlock is a continuous waiting state of a particular process is known as deadlock. Now, how do you <coughs> demonstrate deadlock characterization? What is the characteristics of a deadlock? In a, in a deadlock, the process never finish executing and system resources are tied up and preventing other jobs from never starting. <coughs> Understood? So how do you tell them? What is the necessary condition for causing a deadlock? What are the necessary conditions for causing a deadlock? There are four necessary conditions for causing a deadlock. That is, one is mutual exclusion. Number two, hold and wait. Number three, no preemption. Number four, circular wait. Now the view, in order to enter into a deadlock state, any one of the condition is sufficient. In order to enter into deadlock state, any one of the condition is sufficient. Like any one of the condition is sufficient. But the beauty in this, once the deadlock is obtained, if you verify it, all four conditions are simultaneously hold. That is the beauty of this. Okay, the necessary conditions and presents in order to enter into a deadlock state. In order to enter into, in order to enter into deadlock, any one of the necessary, any one of the condition is sufficient. After entering into the deadlock, if you observe it, all four conditions are simultaneously hold. All four conditions are simultaneously hold. Very good. So, before going to that one, okay, first of all, we'll see what is mutual exclusion. The word itself, it says that mutual exclusion. At a time, it can be used by only one person at a time. At a time, it can be used by only one person at a time. So, <clears throat> So now, let us, in order to understand this mutual exclusion point, now we'll demonstrate with an example. <clears throat> okay, now mutual exclusion. So, your computer is a collection of resources. The resources may be classified into two categories. Number one is shareable. Number two, non-shareable resources. Number one is shareable. Number two is non-shareable. Shareable resource in the sense that resources can be accessed by any number of people at the same time. So, no person is kept waiting for a shareable resource. No person is kept waiting for shareable resource. Best example, read-only file. The best example is Read only file. <clears throat> the best example is a read only file. A read only file, and that implies the file can be read by any number of users at the same time. Now, non shareable resource that implies that resource cannot be shared by more than one person at a time. That resource can be accessed by only one person at a time. That, person, that resource can be accessed by only one person at a time. <clears throat> Now, let us take an example. Uh, if one person is already uh, using that non-shareable resource, if any other person is trying to access that particular resource, he has to be captivating. He has to be captivating. Now, let us take an example printer. If printer is a non-shareable resource, in this mutual exclusion point of view, okay, okay, it is printer is already um, uh, taking one job and executing it. Some another person is trying to execute the at the same time. Sorry, if this particular job is not sanctioned, you have to wait until the, the printer becomes idle. Okay, that is, that is, printer is one of the CPU. CPU is already uh, executing one process. At the same time, you require a CPU. Sorry, CPU is a non-shareable resource. CPU can be accessed by only one person at a time. Okay, so that implies that in case a non-shareable resource is already accessed by one particular process, then other processes are going to be kept waiting until this process has been completed its job. There may be a chance that that resource may not be released by this particular process, then all the rest of the processes are going to enter into deadlock states. That implies the deadlock situation is occurs only because of non-shareable resource. Non-shareable in the sense, 
the resource is going to be shared by only one person at a time. At the same, at the same time, if any other person is trying to use that resource, the day the person is kept waiting. There may be a chance that the wait state is not going to be changed forever. And this particular situation is going to be called as deadlock. <clears throat> that implies at least one resource in a computer system, at least one resource must be held in non-shareable mode. That is only one process at a time can use the resource. If any other process requesting the same resource, that must be wait until this resource has been released. That's this is first one. So the mutual exclusion causes condition causes because of only non-shareable resources. There is no problem with shareable resources. Number two, hold and wait. What is this hold and wait? Just now I have told that. Okay, in a multi-programming environment, more than one process is competing for resources. Hello? Hello? Yeah, Come stay, ma. Then include someone in calling if you have a in a row online class room and I'm going to take it. And then my morning towards a college one time, my parodic teachers then. Can you come to my home? Okay. You can come after twelve thirty, okay? Funny to not Sorry, again I'm getting back. Hold and wait. In a multi-programming environment, more than one process is competing for resources. In case if any process is holding some set of resources and waiting for the resources held by some other process. Similarly, this process is also holding some set of resources and waiting for the resources held by this process. Then both processes are not allowed to continue the execution and this particular situation is going to be called as deadlock. Hence this particular situation is going to be called as Deadlock. Hence, this particular situation is going to be called as deadlock. <coughs> Number three, no preemption. No preemption. What is no preemption? Suppose if your algorithms is not, your operating system is not having a capability of forcibly stopping the execution of one particular process and giving the control of the CPU to some another process, again the system is going to enter into in deadlock state. Let us take an example. Suppose in a multi programming environment, more than one program is simultaneously residing in main memory. While executing one program, in case if any program required an IVA operation, CPU simply switches from one particular job to another job. But what happens is that one process is written a program, the program is structured in an infinite loop. What happens? Now the process, CPU is structured by this particular process. And CPU control will not going to be leap from one particular process to another process. That implies all rest of the process are going to be waiting for the CPU. They are entering into deadlock state. So how do you overcome this? Already we told that the CPU protection is done through timer control. The CPU protection is done through <coughs> timer control. The CPU protection is done through timer control. Okay, after the specified amount of time allocated for this particular process has been completed, the CPU forcibly stopping the execution of this particular process and giving the control of the CPU to some other one. In case if the CPU is not, your operating system is not having such kind of an ability for forcibly stopping the execution of one particular process and giving the control of the CPU to some other one, then your process will going to be enter into that lock situation. That's why your operating should have preemption. But if you not preemption, that implies there may be a chance that you are entering into data. And finally, the last one is circular way. Let us take an example. There are n processors running P0, P1, P2, so on up to P and minus 1. P0 is holding some set of resources and waiting for the resource held by P1. 
and P1 is holding some set of resources and waiting for the resource held by P2. And P2 will so on up to like this. P n minus 1 is holding some set of resources and waiting for P0. Then no process allowed to continue the execution. And this particular situation is going to be called it as deadlock. And this particular situation is going to be called it as deadlock. <coughs> now, how do you explain? Okay, uh, we are talking in terms of theory. How do you explain the deadlock characterization? In order to explain the deadlock characterization in a graphical manner, we will go for a technique known as a resource allocation graph, REG. A resource allocation graph is a technique which can be used to describe a deadlock situation. How can you describe a deadlock situation? Before going to the detailed discussion about uh, the deadlock situations, and now let us define what is a graph. A graph is simply defined as is an ordered pair or it is a set of vertices and edges. A graph is simply defined as it is an ordered pair of vertices and uh, edges. It is an ordered pair of vertices and edges. In this particular situation, vertices are uh, two types. <coughs> it may be a processes or it may be a resources. It may be a processes or it may be a resources. The processes are designated with P1, P2, so on up to Pn, and resources are designated with R1, R2, so on up to Rm. <coughs> now, <coughs> now uh, coming to the second very important, this is vertices. The vertices may be either processes or maybe resources. Okay, I'm coming to the second one, edges. There are two kinds of edges to construct a resource allocation graph. Number one is requesting edge. Number two is assignment edge. The requesting edge is written like this, PI to RJ. That implies process PI is requesting a resource for the RJ in order to complete the task. Process PI is requesting a resource RJ process PA is requesting for a resource RJ and second kind of an edge is that assignment edge. So <coughs> RJ to P the RJ to PI that implies in order to complete RJ resource is being already allocated to process PI. These are the only two kind of edges. This is purely a directed graph. You know that what is a directed graph? A directed graph or you may call it as diagram where all the edges are directed, <coughs> where all the edges are directed, there are only two types of edges are there. Number one is requesting edge, that is process PA is requesting for a resource, RJ. And number two, <coughs> assignment edge, that is uh, the resource RJ already assigned to process PA. The resource RJ is already assigned to process PI. That's it. Now we'll see an example. Now, there are three processes are running. Observe that this diagram, everyone. Okay. There are three processes are running in my computer system. P1, P2, P3. There are three processes are running in my computer system. <coughs> that is P1, P2, P3. <coughs> okay. P1, P2, P3. <coughs> and there are four types of resources are there in my computer system. R1, R2, R3 and R4. <coughs> there is this dot indicates there is only one instance of resource type R1 is available. There is two instances of R2 type resources are there in my computer system. There is only one instance of resource type R3 is there in my computer system. There are three instances of resource type R4 is available in my computer system. This is what is this dots indicates. You can call it as there are three tape drives, two printers, so on up to like this. Okay, now this now this is processes and these are resources. These are called it as vertices. These are called it as vertices and these are edges. This edge is called it as a requesting edge. Process P1 is requesting for a resource R1. Now, that R1 is already allocated to process P2. The R1 is already allocated to, already allocated to process P2. Process P2 make a requisition to, now process P2 is requesting for a resource R3. This is requesting edge. But R3 is already allocated to Process P3, this is an assignment edge. Now, one instance of R2 is allocated to P1, 
Another instance is allocated field two. These are all assignment edges. These two are. Okay. So then, what is the need of representing <coughs> in a graph? Now, whether this whether the graph is in uh, deadlock or not, we'll see now. Now we'll see. Now we'll see. Process P one is requesting. Uh, process P one is holding R two and requesting for a resource R one. R process P two. Holding R1 and R2 and waiting for R3. So P1 is in waiting state. P2 is in waiting state. Process P3 is holding R3 and not waiting for anyone. That implies at any moment of time the process P3 is completed. According to system model, it releases the resource. That resource is given to P2. Then P2 is successfully completed. It releases these two resources. And this resource is granted to P1. P1 is continued. There is no deadlock situation in this. This is how we need to observe it. Or otherwise, simply, is there any cycle in this graph? No, 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 no. Now, any cycle is formed in this graph. There is no cycles in this graph. One, two, three. But it is in operators direction. There is no cycle has been formed. One, two, three, four, five. But there is no edges there. There is no cycle is formed. And The system is in safe state. That implies the so system is not in a deadlock situation. The system is not in a deadlock situation. Is it clear? That is the advantage of constructing this particular graph. Okay, <clears throat> okay. No need to observe each and every process. Whether it's holding some resource, waiting for another one, holding some resource, waiting for another one. Simply, you can check it whether the graph is having a cycle. In case if the graph is having a cycle, you can you may have a deadlock. I why I used a main. We will see at a later stage in the next example. <coughs> This is how do you represent <coughs> a deadlock situation using resource allocation graph. Now we will see by means of an example. Okay, the cycle does not leads in deadlock state. Cycle does not guarantee the system is in deadlock state. Cycle does not guarantee that the system is in deadlock state. Cycle does not leads to deadlock state. What is the meaning of it? Let us know. Now we see. I'll tell you in both the ways. In this, there are three. In this example, there are three processor running: P1, P2, P3. In a similar manner, uh, <coughs> these are vertices. There are uh, another four vertices of resources: R1, R2, R3, R4. There is one instance of R1. There is two instances of R2. One instance of R3 and three instances of R4. Process P1 is uh, <coughs> holding R2, requesting for a resource R1. Process P2 holding R1, R2, and waiting for R3. Process P3 holding <coughs> R3 and waiting for R2. Now we see that process P1 is in waiting state. Why? Because it is holding R2, waiting for R1. Process P2 is also <coughs> holding R1, R2, and waiting for R2, R3. Process P2 holding R1, R2, and waiting for R3. Process P3 is also holding for R3, waiting for R2. All P1, P2, P3, all are in waiting state. That is, all processor and deadlock. <coughs> all processes are in deadlock state. Now, in Now, simply you can say that. Now you see, observe it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cycle is formed. Then that implies now the process is in. Now the system is in deadlock state. Once you have got a cycle in the graph, that indicates that now the system is in deadlock state. Once you have been got a cycle in this, now the system is in deadlock state. That implies. Cycle does not leads to deadlock. If a computer system is entered in a deadlock state, that implies there is a cycle in the system. But cycle does not leads to deadlock. Let us see the example. Now in this, there are P1, P2, P3, P4, four processor running. These are vertices, and another two vertices, R1, R2. There are two instances of R1 is available. There are two instances of R2 is available. Now, <coughs> what happens? <coughs> Now in this particular one, now we observe it. You have got a cycle. Hence you can say that it is in deadlock. But this particular 
M1 is not in a deadlock state. Can you see this? Now, process P1 is holding R2, waiting for R1. This is in waiting state. Process P2, P3, holding R1, waiting for R2. Yes, this is in waiting state. P2 holding R1, not waiting for anyone. P4 is holding R2, not waiting for anyone. Hence, at some, according to system model, after execution of this one, the resource 1 is released and resource 2 is also released. This resource is going to be sanctioned to P1. This resource is sanctioned to, and this R2 resource sanctioned to P3. Both P1, P3 are continued. There is no deadlock in this particular situation. No one is continuously waiting. That implies cycle does not guarantee that the system is in deadlock. But if a deadlock is occurred, there is a cycle in the system. But a cycle does not, may, may not is a deadlock. Now, how can you explain this? Why this is happening in the sense there is multiple instances of resources are there. There are multiple instances of resources there. Suppose if your computer is having a single instance of each resource type, then cycle leads to deadlock. Deadlock implies cycle. So both are satisfied. So that is, cycle leads to deadlock and deadlock leads to Second, but in case if a computer system is having multiple instances of each resource type, cycle may not lead to a deadlock, may may not lead to a deadlock, but deadlock leads to a cycle. Thus, is it clear? That is, if a graph contains no cycles, no deadlock. If a graph contains a cycle, if only one instance of resource type, then it is in deadlock. If several instances for each resource type, possibly may may not have a deadlock. That's this is. How do you explain the deadlock characterization using resource allocation graph? Okay, how do you explain deadlock in <coughs> situation using <coughs> resource allocation graph? Now we can clearly understood that what is a deadlock. Now how do you handle this particular deadlock situation? <coughs> in order to handle this particular deadlock situation, we have three kinds of methods. We have we have, in order to handle deadlock situation, we have three methods. Number one, <clears throat> we can use a protocol to ensure that the system will never enter into a deadlock state. What is this? We can use a protocol. You know what is a protocol? A protocol is a set of rules and conventions to share the resources. So we have to write a protocol in such a way that the system will never enter into the deadlock situation. Point number two, allow the system to enter into the deadlock. Allow the system to enter into the deadlock, then use, recover, then recover. Allow the system to enter into the deadlock, observe it. Once the deadlock is obtained, use some recovery algorithm to break the deadlock and continue the execution. This is second time. And the third kind of uh, solution is that ignore the problem together. And presented the deadlocks will never occur in a system used by the this is ignore the problem and pretend that deadlocks will never occur in the system. This is the solution most of the operating system will use. If deadlock is encountered, the user is going to be uh, forcibly stopping the execution of any one of the process by again uh, end of the processes. Okay, most of the operating system, including Unix, is also use this particular technique. Now coming to the first one, ensure that. Ensure that the system will never enter into the deadlock state. That is, it can be done by using two techniques, deadlock prevention and avoidance. We'll see what is this particular deadlock prevention and avoidance. Okay, so what is uh, deadlock prevention and avoidance? We'll see it in a meanwhile. Number two, allow the system to enter into a deadlock state. Uh, you have to write one algorithm to observe whether the system is in deadlock state. And once you have been observed that the system is in deadlock state, then you can recover by using another algorithm. Now, coming to the next one. We'll see one of the solutions of this. Come to the first one. So deadlock prevention. That is the first solution for uh, handling deadlocks is that we can use a protocol to ensure that the system will never enter into the deadlock situation. In order to meet such kind of a requirement, we have two things. Number one, deadlock prevention. Number two, deadlock avoidance. There are two techniques are there. Number one is deadlock prevention. Number two, deadlock avoidance. What is deadlock prevention and what is deadlock avoidance? Deadlock prevention in the sense, 
what are the necessary conditions which causes for a deadlock what are the necessary conditions which is causing for a deadlock you please try to see that the conditions will never occur in the system you understand my point what are the necessary conditions which are causing for a deadlock you please try to see that the conditions will never occur in the computer system that is what is deadlock prevention deadlock avoidance next one deadlock avoidance you have to allocate the resources in such a way that the system will never enter into the deadlock state so the resources is completely under the control of operating system so that your operating system must see that there is always one process has to be continue the execution that implies the resources must be allocated in such a way that the system will never enter into the <coughs> deadlock situation now coming to the deadlock prevention why i told uh, what i told in deadlock prevention what are the necessary conditions which is causing for a deadlock you please try to see that that conditions will never occur in the system so what are the necessary conditions which are causing for a deadlock there is four conditions mutual exclusion hold and wait no preemption circular wait these are the four conditions what you are going to be doing coming to the first one mutual exclusion so already i told that your computer system is equipped with two kinds of resources shareable and non shareable resources we are not getting any deadlock situation with shareable resources we are getting a deadlock situation with only non shareable resources okay so that implies non shareable resources now what he has been told that what are the necessary conditions which is causing for a deadlock you please try to see that the necessary conditions will never occur in a system how can you do this please uh, simply one scientist has been given a solution that please remove <coughs> okay <clears throat> so printer is a non shareable resource already i told that printer is a non shareable resource okay printer can be shared by only one person at a time if already one person is uh, taking the print on the printer if another person is making for the resource printer definitely has to be kept waiting that's it there may be a chances that this particular waiting state is not going to be changed forever hence it may be enter into a deadlock state that implies that deadlock situation is occur because of non shareable resource then the solution for this one is one scientist told that remove all non shareable resources printer it is a non shareable resource you can remove it there is no problem by the computer suppose cpu is also a non shareable resource cpu can be used by only one process at a time so if you want to remove the cpu if you remove a cpu then what is the need of doing all this so it cannot be possible so you observe it i am telling one of the solution and i am telling that i am i am telling that the solution is not possible finally my conclusion is that we cannot see that uh, deadlock prevention will going to be happen okay so now the solution is remove non shareable resource if you remove non shareable resource the computer system will not going to work at all that's it that's why it is not possible coming to the second one hold and wait what is hold and wait already i told that in case if any process holding some set of resources and waiting for the resources held by some another process similarly similarly that process is also holding some set of resources and waiting for the resource held by this process then both process are not allowed to continue the execution and this particular situation is going to be called it as deadlock hence this particular situation is going to be called it as deadlock the solution what we have been seen is that we'll see what solution must guarantee that whatever whatever a process request the resource it does not hold by anyone so you please try to see that whatever the resource you are requesting the resource should not be locked by any other process how can you guarantee that okay that's why one scientist has been told that okay solution is that before requesting for any particular resource first of all you should have an none you should release all the resources whatever you have been already acquired you should release all the resources whatever you have been already acquired by what happens this is also what happens is that resource utilization becomes very low and starvation is also possible let us take an example there are two processor running p1 and p2 in my computer system there is two resources tape drive and printer 
In order to execute process P1, it requires tape drive and printer. In order to execute process P2, it is also required tape drive and printer. We have passed the process P1 holding tape drive, waiting for printer. Process P2 holding the printer and waiting for tape drive. Then process P1 is making a requesting for printer. Immediately operating system says that release your tape drive. Then tape drive is released. Similarly, for process P2, printer is released. Then printer is sanctioned to P1 and um, tape drive is sanctioned to P2. Again, process P1 is holding printer, waiting for tape drive. Process P2 holding tape drive, waiting for printer. Then both are ending. So the, the both are going to be in deadlock situation. That becomes what happens is that okay, it cannot be possible. Okay, only resource exchange is done, the execution is not done. Another scientist has been given another solution that is starvation. Another scientist has been told that what are the set of resources has been required to execute about the process. Please try to all resources before starts its execution. He is given this solution. But what is this particular solution? Suppose in order to execute process P1, it requires tape drive and printer. But um, by using tape drive, it does not, not require printer. Okay, let us take uh, it is a 20 minutes of job. First 10 minutes, uh, the process P1 is spending with uh, tape drive, and last 10 minutes, spending with printer. If two resources are allocated at the same time, what happens is that while doing the operation with the tape drive, the printer is going to be sitting idle. While doing operation with the printer, the tape drive is sitting idle. That becomes so resource utilization is becomes very low. Suppose if you are allocating all the resources before starting the execution of a particular process, the resource utilization becomes low. The main goal of an operating system is that to keep all the resources busy at all the times. That's why it is fine. In case if you are uh, having the second solution in, in case uh, before requesting any particular new resources, first of all you should have none. If you implement that particular resource, the only resource exchange is done, but that lock starvation is possible. That's why this condition is also not practically implemented. Now, third one, no preemption. No preemption. What is no preemption? No preemption in the sense, if your operating system is not having a capability of forcibly stopping the execution of one particular process and giving the control of the CPU to some another process, again, the system is in deadlock state. Suppose if you are given a permission, Yes, you are allowed to forcibly stopping the execution of one particular process. Then what happens is that <clears throat> one program is always runs in the system kernel, which is known as operating system. So that process is completely running. What you are doing is that your operating system is forcibly stopping the program itself. What happens? Your entire system is going to be down. That is the problem. So this is also not practically possible. If a process that is holding <coughs> Some resources are requesting for another resource, cannot immediately allocate it. All resources currently be released. Preempted resources are uh, added to the list of resources which is the process waiting. The process will be restarted only when it has re again <coughs> its old resources as well as new resources is requesting. That's it. So this is also not going to be possible. Now, coming to the last one, circular weight. Coming to the last one. <clears throat> Coming to the last one, <clears throat> circular weight. What is this particular circular weight? P0 is holding some resources, waiting for P1. P1 is holding some set of resources, waiting for P2. So on up to P and minus 1, holding some resources and waiting for the resources held by P0. Then simply the solution is that about any one of the process. Then once aborted, whatever the resources which has been holded, it has been given to next process so that the deadlock situation is going to be overcome. But the situation is that whatever the process you are aborted, in case if it is an operating system, what happens? The entire system is going to be down. That's why the circular rate is also not possible. That is, impose a total ordering of all resource types and require that each process required resources in an increasing order of enumeration. That is circular weight. So, <clears throat> This is not possible, this is not possible, this is not possible, this is not. We have been told some solutions, but the solutions are not practically possible. So my conclusion is that deadlock prevention, that is, okay, what are the necessary conditions which is causing for a deadlock? <coughs> we cannot ensure that the system, we cannot ensure that it will never occur in a system. So this definitely occur. So there is deadlock is compulsory. Now, so what is deadlock prevention? 
what are the necessary conditions which is causing for a dead clock. You please try to see that that number will occur in a system. That number occur in a system. So that, <coughs> that number will occur in a system. Then it is not possible. That's why we enter into next one, deadlock avoidance. What is deadlock avoidance? So what is deadlock avoidance? You need to allocate the resources of a particular process. You need to allocate the resources to a particular processes in such a way that the system will never enter into the deadlock situation. Whatever the resource allocation ordering is done, in such a way that the system will never enter into the deadlock situation. The system will never enter into the deadlock situation. <coughs> that is what I told. And in order to do this kind of a thing, in order to do such kind of a thing, so the operating system has been given an additional prayer or information, what kind of resources are available, what kind of resources are required for each and every process, at what moment of time. Otherwise, it is not possible. So, it requires that the system has some additional prayer or information available. What that additional prayer or information should be required? So, what is the maximum number of resources which is required to complete a particular process? What is currently it is required? The rest of resources may be required at what moment of time? You need to allocate this. That implies in order to practically implement a block avoidance technique. In order to practically implement a deadlock avoidance technique, we the operating system should have an additional prior information relating to a particular process in such a way that what are the maximum number of resources that is required to each and every process. And what are the set of resources which is required at what moment of time? It should be known to your operating system. So that the operating system will be going to be allocate the resources in such a way that the system will never occur in a deadlock situation. That's it. That is the first one. The simplest and most useful model that requires that each process declare what is the maximum number of resources of each kind that may need it. In order to complete your process, what is the maximum number of resources of each type you needed? First, you clearly mention it. Number two, the deadlock evidence algorithm dynamically examines. Dynamically, that is, at the time of execution, resource allocation state to ensure that the system will never enter into a deadlock situation. That is circular way. That implies whatever the currently available, this is, you please observe it, circular weight condition. That implies whatever the currently available resources must be, you need to define a sequence in such a way that the currently available resources must be satisfy any one of the waiting process. The currently available resources must be satisfying any one of the waiting process. So the CPU has to be scheduled the jobs in such a way that Okay, the CPU has to be defined a safe sequence. The CPU has to be defined an order of sequence, order of execution of processes in such a way that the currently available resources must be satisfy any one of the waiting process. Okay, now, point number three. The resource allocation state is defined by the number of available resources and allocated resources and the maximum demands of the processes. The resource allocation state is defined in terms of what is the maximum number of resources which is required by each and every process, what is already currently held by each and every process, and how many need they are required, that is maximum minus allocation. That's why the ordering is called it as in what order the resources must be allocated in such a way that the system will never enter into the deadlock state. The system will never enter into the deadlock state. The only one condition is that, very important uh, condition is that, whatever the currently available resources are there, it should satisfy any one of the wedding process. You need to define an ordering like this. That ordering is going to be called as safe state. You may call it as safe state sequence. The safe state sequence must be defined in such a way that 
the currently available resources must be satisfied in the one of the waiting process. That's it. Now, in order to do this particular, in order to define this particular safe sequence, in order to define this particular safe sequence, what the operating system is going to do? Whenever a process is requesting for a particular resource, immediately operating system observes that whether I am eligible for immediately sanction that resource or no. By sanctioning, you try to see that the system will never occur into the deadlock state. Why? Because after sanctioning, the process is executed, whatever the set of resources has been released, again it should be satisfied any one of the waiting process. This is recurrently satisfied, all, all jobs are completed from the ready queue. So that's why when a process requests an available resource, system decides that if immediately allocation <coughs> will leave the system in safe state or not. After immediately allocating it, in case system is in unsafe state, that implies whatever the currently available resource which is not satisfying any one of the waiting process, then the system is going to be enters into a deadlock state. Then immediately the request may be, cannot be granted. <coughs> That's why you need to decide. You need to decide whenever a process is requesting for a particular resource, if you, whether immediately allocated or not. In case if you immediately allocate it, the system is only in safe state. Okay, you should be see that it is in safe state. If it is not in safe state, please don't try to allocate it. <clears throat> okay, now what do I mean by safe state? The system is in safe state. If there exists a sequence, P1, P2, so on up to Pn, in such a way that after executing P1, whatever the set of resources which is available, it should satisfy P2. After executing process P2, whatever the set of resources which is available, it should satisfy process P3. So on up to like this. That implies the currently available resources should be satisfied to the next process, to the next process, like this. That is, the system is in safe. If there exists a sequence P1 to Pn of all processes in the system in such a way that Pi, each Pi, then the resource, so Pi still request can it satisfy the currently available resources plus resources allocated by Pj, J is less than I. That's it. Otherwise, the resources are not going to be sanctioned. That is, if Pi resource needs are not immediately available, then Pi's can be wait until all Pj has been completed. Yes, whatever the resources you are requested, if the resource request, if the resources are not available from the operating system, immediately you need to wait until all other processes are to be completed and there must be released the resource and it is going to be sanctioned to you. Otherwise, sorry. When a PJ is finished, PA can obtain the needed resources and execute and return all the resources and terminate the process. You know what is this? Why? Because system model has been implemented by using three system calls, request, use and release. Okay, so once the process execution has been successfully completed, <coughs> you have to return back all the resources to your operating system. Now, now, if process PI terminates, PI can I plus 1 can obtain, it needs resources and so on like this. That implies, after completion of PI, PI plus 2 can be continued by releasing the resources of PI plus 1. That implies, <coughs> currently available resources must be satisfied any one of the waiting processes. Otherwise, it is not possible. There is a safe sequence. So, in case if you orderly execute in safe sequence manner, the system will never enter into the data. It is the responsibility of the operating system to define a safe sequence <coughs> in such a way that the system will never enter into the clock state. So, finally, I conclude with this topic. If a system is in safe state, that implies there is no data. If a system is in an unsafe state, there may be a possibility for getting a data. So, you have to write an algorithm in such a way that the system will never enter into an unsafe state. So the resources must be allocated in such a way that the system must be always define a safe sequence. That is, so this can be demonstrated uh, by means of a small example. 
this can be demonstrated by means of a small example. What is this example? Now we are going to be see. <clears throat> okay, by means of a problem. Uh, this uh, problem is already given an exam. Okay, so how examination in gate examination the question has been given? I'll tell you. Now there are three processes are running in my computer system. Yaroma? Jain to Ninja Timon. Example. There are three processors running in my computer system process P0, P1, P2. There are total number of resources available in my computer system is 12 tape drives. In order to complete process P0, it requires 10 tape drives. In order to complete process P1, it requires 4 tape drives. In order to complete process P2, it requires 9 tape drives. <coughs> but the current needs of each and every process, uh, process P0 holds 5 tape drives, process P1 holds 2 tape drives, process P2 holds another 2 tape drives. So the total number of resources consumed is 9. So the total available resource is 9. Uh, sorry, available is 12. 12 minus 9, there is only 3 resources are. Uh, uh, remaining. Now, the process P0 is holding 5 tape drives and requires another 5 tape drives that is a need. This is going to be called as remaining. Surname last question, last year. Surname last So, in order to complete process P0, it requires 5 additional resources. In order to complete process P1, it requires another 2 additional resources. Process P2 requires another 7 additional resources. Now, you see that the requirement of this process P0 is 5. 2 and 7. The currently available is 3. Currently available is 3. Now currently available 3. Yeah, I know. Please book Okay, now the currently available resources is only three. So the three is satisfying process P1. Okay, so that now for the available three resources is given to process P1. So that already P1 is holds two resources. Now it is allocated with three, three plus two. Now the total five resources are available now. Now, among uh, this uh, P0 and P7, 5 is satisfied by P0, so that the next process is P0. So, all 5 resources is given to them. Already it holds 5. 5 plus 5, total available is now 10. Now, the 10 is satisfying process P2, so that you can give to process P2. So, the resources must be allocated in the sequence P1, P0, and P2. In this order, the system is in safe state. <laughs> The currently available resource must be satisfied any one of the waiting process. This is now. Suppose let us take uh, they have been an examination, they have been given a situation, and they have been given a situation that if process PT is requesting one resource, it is immediately sanctioned it without saying anything. Then what is currently available resources now is only two. So five, two, and remaining is six. 5, 2, 6, which one is satisfying? So, 2 is satisfying. So, that this 2 is given to process P1. So, 2 plus 2, the currently available resource is only 4. 
Now this uh, P0 requires 5 and P2 requires 6 resources. So the 4 is not satisfying any one of the requests. Any, any, any P0 and P2, hence the system is in deadlock state. That's it. So that's why what I'm uh, telling is that whenever a process is requesting a resource, you please don't try to sanction immediately by sanctioning whether the system can be defined a safe sequence or not. In case if it is unable to define a safe sequence, please don't try to sanction that. That is going to be called as In examination, the question is, okay, the P2 is requesting for additional resource. One, it is immediately sanctioned. Now, whether the system is in safe state or unsafe state. The system is in unsafe state. The system is in deadlock. That's it. This is what is an example. It's a clear. Now, before uh, go for the next very important discussion is bankers algorithm. So this is uh, not going to be completed in short span of time. We will going to be covered tomorrow. And so today, what we have been seen is that what is a deadlock? What is the necessary conditions for a deadlock? What are the different methods for handling a deadlock? And this uh, one of the method is that deadlock prevention. In deadlock prevention, what are the necessary conditions which is causing for a deadlock? You please try to see that the conditions never occur in the system, which is not possible. And after that, we have been seen a safe state. We need to define a safe sequence in such a way that the system will never enter into the deadlock state. That implies whatever the set of resources which is currently available, it should satisfy any one of the waiting process. It should satisfy any one of the current waiting process. This is what we have been seeing. Now, this solution is now applied to multiple processes with multiple instances. Okay, how can we apply? We'll see in the next session. That is in Banker's algorithm. We'll see that kind of a discussion tomorrow. That is a Monday. Is it clear, everyone? Okay, that is uh, stopping my presentation for today. And thank you, everyone. Is anybody there? Today's my presentation is over. Yeah, the presentation is completed. Again, uh, Monday. Okay. I hope tomorrow is Monday. Yes. Okay. Okay, Monday, same time. Okay, thank you. Is everything right? Can I stop?